Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, my guest today is uh, Jason Pereira. Jason is well known. He uh, is a frequent contributor to the Globe and Mail and uh, often quoted in various publications. Um, he also is the president of the Financial Planning Association of Canada, which I joined uh, maybe a little more than a year ago now and have uh, really loved. So I strongly encourage membership uh, for those working on the individual or financial planning side uh, to reach out to Financial Planning Association of Canada. I'll include a link here. Uh, this episode is good for credits uh, pretty much across the board. So we'll have Alberta Life and ANS. We'll have life insurance in all other provinces. It will be good for a compliance credit on the IROC side and good for a financial planning credit on the FP Canada side and good for the usual IAS credit as well. Uh, and I'm doing a few compliance episodes here. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can round out some of those IROC uh, needs that way. Okay, we're going to roll um, right into the interview here. Uh, before I do, the number for today's episode is five. The number for today's episode is five. Following the episode, I'll have some comments here, but uh, you'll see that uh, Jason is quite passionate about this and has a good, I was just sort of financial planners take on the uh, fiduciary concept, which is where we spent a lot of time on this uh, interview. I think I'm gonna have Jason back on. There's a bunch of questions that I had for him, but I felt like if we asked, if I asked those questions, then I would end up down a rabbit hole. So if you have um, follow-on questions for him, please post them. You can post them on the YouTube channel just down below, or if you're listening, you can log in, same place you do your quizzes, and there'll be a discussion forum there where you can ask questions as well. Uh, thanks very much and enjoy the interview. Hi, I'm joined today by uh, Jason Pereira. Jason is uh, well known as a uh, advocate for financial planning, runs a uh, successful financial planning shop in Toronto, dealing with uh, high net worth business owners, complex cases, cross-border. And uh, Jason, is that a fair intro? That's a fair intro. I mean, you also forgot picker of fights on Twitter, but that's a different story altogether. <laughs> I don't think it's just on Twitter either, but uh, oh, it's LinkedIn also. But whatever, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> fair. Um, yep. even maybe occasionally in the Globe and Mail, but occasionally in the Globe and Mail, yes. Yeah, but I, I never read the comment section there, but because it's you know <laughs> the drive me nuts. It's uh, never read the comment section in general, right? Um, no, no, that's where trolls live. <laughs> it's fair. Um, so the uh, it's actually the last Globe and Mail. I think maybe your second last Globe and Mail article that I was hoping we could chat a little bit about here because you wrote a pretty uh, thorough piece on sort of the state of fiduciary duty in Canada. And it's something I know you've thought a lot about and been dealing with for years in one form or another. Can you just give us sort of the Cole's notes about fiduciary duty for financial advisors? Sure. I'm going to preface this by saying that I'm not a lawyer. So some of the finer points may not be exactly articulated correctly, as a lawyer once pointed out to me. Um, but here's what it is. Let's, let's define fiduciary duty. And this is not a easy thing because uh, different opinions abide. And it also depends on various interpretations of case law. But I'm going to use the USCFP board's definition of what this means. And it's a, basically a three-pronged um, the standard. And the first standard is that you have a duty of loyalty that requires the financial planner to put the client's needs ahead of their own, to avoid and disclose and obtain approval on all conflicts of interest and act without with, without consideration for their own interests. So bottom line is every possible capacity clients serviced first beyond anyone else's important, anyone else's, uh, beyond anyone else's um, needs. Secondly, is a duty to act with care, prudence, and due diligence. So basically, prove what it is and why like this is not a you know heuristic exercise to advise people and lastly is a duty to follow the client's instructions even if they're in conflict with your recommendations right so at the end of the day they're they're they have final say at all things so this is the highest legal standard that one can be held to within pretty much any industry it's that you have a relationship with a another individual in which you basically have a disproportionate amount of information, knowledge, power, whatever it is, and they rely on you and are dependent upon you to, to basically act within their best interest. So that establishes kind of the parameters for what we're getting at. And this is very common in the US because 
going back as early as 1940 in the Investment Advisors Act, they established the RIA, Registered Investment Advisor uh, Licensing Criteria, which basically enforced a fiduciary responsibility going back to the 1940s. So they have a long, lengthy history in, uh, of case law. In Canada, we lack that. So what is the situation in Canada? In Canada, there is really only one licensing regime that imposes a fiduciary responsibility, and that is a portfolio management um, licensing. Now, that's regardless if it's on the IROC side or if it's in, if you're an ICPM. But here's the thing. It only technically applies within the context of the investment selection. It does not apply universally to everything an advisor does. And that's where the gap is. So we have that. Um, as for beyond that, there's a couple of what we'll call voluntary standards that you can volunteer for. So uh, the CFP, sorry, the uh, if you're a US CFP, you're held to an omnibus financial uh, fiduciary standard. If you are a holder of a CFA, the same thing. And if you are a member of the Financial Planning Association of Canada, which I'm the president of, then you volunteered into that. Now, the difference is the first one is a legal standard that basically you are legally liable for. And the other three are technically voluntary. If I want to get out of them, all I got to do is quit the club, right? And all the club can do to penalize you is basically kick you out. So not the same thing as a legally enforceable standard. And that's a problem in my mind. Right. So just going back to the US CFP situation, mm -hmm. the do they actually use the F word in there? Do they say fiduciary? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, it was, I believe, and I might get the date wrong. It was October of 20. 20, that they imposed the omnibus CF uh, fiduciary standard. And this came on the heels of, it's a long story, but on the, of a massive debate where the Department of Labor tried to impose a fiduciary standard upon the entire industry. So the equivalent of MFDA and IROC advisors would have been covered by the, by the same thing. And they, this was, this was shot down by the Trump administration. It might be revitalized by the Biden administration. But anyway, long story short, the SEC created something else called Regulation BI, which is not dissimilar from some of the CFR reforms we have, that basically imposed a best interest standard, which is lower than fiduciary. It's, it's all semantics in the end. Well, not really semantics. There's legal. There's, there's no semantics and legality, but to advisors, they perceive it as semantics. Um, but the reality is, is that um, the CF, CFP in uh, the CFP board in the U.S. in an act of courage and doing what's right, basically, I think the statement was something to the effect of, "We know this is going to cost us members. We don't care. This is the right thing to do." Yeah, I mean, a notable example of that is uh, I know about this is before this became before this actually happened, but maybe five or six years ago, I know State Farm, which is a big, big firm in the United States, uh, told their agents that they could no longer carry CFP certification. And this is part of the problem in Canada. Who, who holds or where do the majority of CFPs work in this country? The big five right. institutions. Yeah, it's going to be rough. I don't know exactly what the numbers are today. They used to publish, they used to publish the uh, hiring firms by CFP. And uh, I haven't seen those numbers in a while, but and my guess is roughly 55% work in uh, yeah, one of the one of the big yeah. banks. So. And, and if you look at what's happened recently under CFR, where these banks are using CFR as an excuse to go proprietary for all the funds sold below the full service brokerage level, the argument is could uh, could someone with an imposed CF, uh, fiduciary responsibility through a CFP or otherwise technically qualify? as a fiduciary? Could they actually execute their job as a fiduciary if all they can sell is proprietary funds knowing full well that there might be a better alternative elsewhere? It's a tough balance to strike. And I sort of feel for FP Canada around this where totally. you, know, if you, you, you want to implement uh, something like a fiduciary standard or a fidu like a direct fiduciary standard. But at the same time, um, you know, there's been a couple of the big five banks that have adopted CFP as their sort of planning designation of choice lately. And I feel like, you know, you try to gain some traction for a CFP and at the same time, not, uh, you know, have the, des the designation can't be watered down. So I, I know that uh, 2019 in Canada, we saw a duty of loyalty adopted as part of our mm -hmm. standards of professional responsibility. Any thoughts around duty of loyalty? I think it was a very definitive positive step. Um, and, you know, I, the funny thing is, if you look at the wording of the duty of loyalty versus the fiduciary duty in the US, they are very, very similar. So yeah. in fact, there's been cases where, and this is where we'll all go back to Canada. 
There have been court cases that stated that the advisor had a fiduciary responsibility over the client, but the difference between that and a fiduciary duty in general is that a fiduciary duty is applied omnibus across the entire, uh, entire industry by typically by legislation. Whereas, whereas in that case, it was the specific facts and particulars of the relationship between the client and the advisor that created a de facto relationship that was a fiduciary responsibility. Again, preface, I'm not a lawyer, but this is my complete understanding. So none of them was a strong enough case as to say, hey, this proves that all advisors are fiduciaries, right? That was not a case. It was, it was like, hey, in this narrow framing, you had a fiduciary responsibility. And, and I'm going to say, I also understand where FP Canada is coming from on this. There's, you know, the reality is, first off, we're all serviced by the CFP becoming a, you know, the prominent recognized designation people can trust and the plan fin in Quebec, of course. And the, the, and they've done a lot to bring up the standard for what it means to be a CFP. And I, and I commend them and the duty of, of loyalty was something that was very important. I think it's slowly getting us towards that fiduciary state, but at the other end of the spectrum, they have to worry about, you know, being ostracized by the, the large institutions that they service. And, you know, no one, no one would win if the big five suddenly decided to just ban the CFP outright across the board. And you know what? There's plenty of precedent to say banks do scummy things in this country. So let's, uh, let's just not say it won't happen. And then, so this, uh, I think motivates you and I know you and, and I can't remember who all the co-founders are, but you and four or five other people get together and a little bit more than that. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to uh, shortchange anybody here, but I know <laughs> I was late to the party on this. Um, but you and a group of people get together and sort of say, you know, we, we need an organization that's going to, among other things, promote the fiduciary standard. So can you chat a little bit about um, Financial Planning Association of Canada? Yeah. So the Financial Planning Association of Canada came largely out of you know, frustration, different frustrations from different people. Mine, I'll speak to my experience. And that was traveling to the US for conferences and seeing just how far ahead of us they were on so many aspects of, of what it means to professionalize this industry. But then also speaking to planners from around the world, places like Australia, the UK, Brazil, the Netherlands, India, it doesn't matter, like all over the place, South Africa, and finding that in general, there's just this general wave of professionalization of our industry. And I'm going to keep on saying the difference between industry and profession. And it's happening everywhere. But it, we're all on this different trajectory and arc. And what I found was, in general, that Canada was so woefully behind, it was frightening. Um, to the point where even things like deferred sales charge bans uh, had happened in India, you know, as of right now, probably 11, 12 years ago. Right. And we were still having an argument about this in Canada, where the U.S. is the Americans were having arguments about about, you know, universal fiduciary responsibility on the entire industry with strong support from members of the advisory community, like large bodies that were pushing for it. And we were here having a fight about stopping people from getting getting five points that could be technically lied lied about when they when they basically buy something. It's like I'm sitting here going like I feel like I live in the stone age, right? Like I literally was coming back to Canada every time feeling depressed about it. And you know, in talking to many other people, everybody else, you know, they had their own gripes, they had their own issues. And but it was all the same thing. We felt that there was, you know, with the respect to the bodies that exist already and I'm on the board of at least one other one, uh, we felt that there was no one that kind of outlined what professionalism looked like. And, and then this is a major issue that we studied and, and found with other organizations is you get them together around a common cause or common belief or common industry or whatever it is. But if you don't have agreed upon destination, you've got a problem because every time you try to move the line, oh, well, half the body doesn't want to do it, half the body does. And we basically said, look, the only solution to this is this is what professionalism means to us. And, the, and our charter clearly outlines what that means in terms of proficiency, fiduciary standards, just transparency, um, evidence-based uh, advice, like so many different dimensions is to say, look, if we are doing this, well, there is no way that we are not going to be considered professionals. And basically said, this is the destination. If you're going to cut a check to this organization and be a member, know that that's where we're going. And there's no arguing about this, right? So we have a clear destination. And this is, and if I may, this is so important for one reason, for one, particularly one reason. And that's that the best version of what it means to be a financial planner, think about that versus everything else. You know, this industry was born to distribution, distribution of product, right? And that's, that's our, and, and it's unfortunately mired in the mindset of what, what happened there. But the best version of this industry or professionals who know what they're doing, who sit across from Canadians and ask, what is it that you need to accomplish to live the fullest version of your life? 
And how do I take everything that exists out there and the knowledge I have of this ecosystem and help you deliver on that and live the fullest version of your life? And we help on some level people self-actualize in, in a proactive way. And there is no other professional that will do that. Like your doctor, you go for checkups, but you only go when you're sick. The lawyers, you hope to never go to. Accountants, you go to because you have to file taxes. But who sits across from you and says, what is going to make you live the fullest version of your life? And when you think about for every one advisor who views the world that way and basically tries to deliver upon that promise, if they're dealing with anywhere between, let's call it a you know, manageable amount of like 100 households per, that is a you know, think about how many of us it takes to get there before we're bettering the entire of Canadian society. That's why this is important. And that's why we need to fast forward everything we're doing towards professionalization. Because, you know, if we don't get it, if we don't start bringing people, if we don't start earning the trust of, of everybody in the ecosystem, from members of the system to the regulators to the public, we're never going to get to that. So what would be the hallmarks of a profession that you could see would allow you to say, because you, you made the distinction, you said industry versus profession. So yeah. what would change in this business that would create a profession, let's say? I think the three tent poles that we've identified at FPAC is first and foremost, a fiduciary responsibility. As professionals who are acting on behalf of others, we have to be held to the highest standard that says that we are here for you, not for ourselves. Okay. You know, we're going to be paid fairly and disclosed in a disclosed way. In fact, that actually goes to the second, the second piece, which is full and complete transparency. Um, the reality is basically you can't judge value if you don't understand what you're paying for it and vice versa. And we can't actually start to set market prices around the things we do if we don't have full and transparent clean disclosure. And then the last piece is, is basically uh, uh, the third pillar is resolve evidence-based advice, which is, as I'm sure Jason, you'll know, actually, we're, we're doing this recording on the day that FPAC's holding a uh, seminar with Professor Moshe on debunking, like he hates me using that term, <laughs> on discussing the 4% rule and that heuristic and the flaws within that logic. So what's a profession? A profession, when you think about any of them, it is lawyer, lawyers, accountants, doctors, I'll always, always go back to engineers, is an educated body who brings that skill set to bear on behalf of a populace that they are serving and does so specifically where the knowledge is what's important, not the product. Right. At the end of the day, you know, the doctors, some doctors may be distributing drugs as their primary you know, vocation. But the reality is, is that they're there to apply their knowledge, not there to sell more, you know, Viagra. I'll pick on that for whatever reason. Right. Um, and, and that's the, those are the keys. We need to get to that. Yeah. And one of the criticisms I hear sometimes from people who and I used to be in this camp, Jason, I used to not be somebody who thought that the fiduciary standard would be a meaningful change. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, but I've come around. I, I'm yeah. not, you know, um, but, you know, one of the criticisms you hear is, well, so doctors are fiduciaries, but there are still bad doctors out there. There's bad there's bad people in every job. Right. Like the reality is there's, you know, same thing. I have this discussion. People complain I beat up on banks too much. And I always say, look, it's I beat up on institutionalized systems with bad incentives that lead to bad outcomes. That's what I'm beating up on. There are good and bad people operating in every institution that I've met. Like even some of the scummiest ones, I'm like, wow, you need to get out of there because you're too good for this place. But yeah, you're never going to solve for the bad actor problem. You know, Jason, simple question. What do you call the person who graduates law school with, uh, with the, at the at the bottom of his class? Yeah, they're, st the, they're still a lawyer. They're still a lawyer, right? Yeah. You know, same thing with doctors, right? You have the ones who, do you, do you really want a doctor who graduated by 1%, like on average? But those people exist. You're never going to do away with that. But, but here's the thing, two things. First off, one, I'm a big believer that the way, you know, going back to nudge and all the behavioral finance stuff, the way you engineer a system creates incentives. Actually, this was uh, Freakonomics. The way you, the engineer system creates incentives. The system is currently not engineered and policed in a manner that incentivizes the best end out result for the client. That needs to change, and a fiduciary responsibility is paramount. Because look at just look at the current regime. You know, I posted on LinkedIn the other day about a guy who committed, I think it was like eighty acts of of basically yes. like a forgery yeah. or something like that. Yeah, like, like it was I ridiculous. Like photocopied client signatures. I, I, I saw yeah. this. Yes, horrific. Yeah. There's no there's no arguing that this wasn't intentional, and he had a one year suspension. A one year, like what kind of profession are we if that is the level of, you know, someone commits fraud 
and they get to basically go back to work in a year, like give me a break. That should be a permanent ban. So the reality is, is that we need to police ourselves better. The fiduciary responsibility is the highest standard that we can't argue with that. And then the second piece, and this is one made by Michael Kitsis in the US, who, for those of you who haven't discovered him, please just sign up for everything he does. Because <laughs> it will, and, and I, I will tell you, if you don't, and listen to all 200 plus episodes of his, of his primary podcast, because if you do not come out of that a changed person and want to be better as a planner, I don't want to know you because that, that shows the best version of what we can be. But here, one of the points he made on fiduciary responsibility is that, you know, benchmarked in the U.S., the average amount of money spent to acquire a new client is somewhere in excess of $10,000, right? That's when that's including the labor of the individual, right? Now, maybe, you know, they, they don't rely on people walking into banks just handing the money in, in that country. But nevertheless, he made the point of, you know, we talk about what advisors have to charge to be profitable. This goes right back to client acquisition cost. And part of the reason why client acquisition cost is so high is because we put so much burden on the client to figure out if they're dealing with someone they should be or not. We have all, think about it, we have all these online checklists for like, here's how you interview a financial advisor to see if you're getting the right person, right? And, you know, we publish guide, we publish guides on this, you know, the Globe and Mail's had these lists, like all kinds of things. You just got to Google them, they're all over the place. But do we, does any other profession put this upon their people? Like, do you walk into a doctor's office and worry that you might not have a fiduciary doctor, someone who's just a distributor for a freaking drug company? You don't have that. So we put so much burden on the consumer to do all this. And then we have to spend all this time educating them. And this costs us all. Because if God willing, we got to the point where someone could throw a stone and hit a fiduciary advisor that had to do the right thing for them. Because the cost of acquisition would drop for all of us. The level of trust amongst the consumer would increase. Quest trade commercials that questioned our value would no longer be a thing because the, because the masses would know we had value. I know you just had John Degui on your podcast talking about those, whatever, he's got like 70 questions to ask to choose your, your financial advisor. And, uh, you know, it just seems like, yeah, good. I think no matter what, you still should be choosing a financial advisor who's a fit for you. But so many of those questions that John has in his uh, stand-up document are like really designed to make this sort of screen that you're suggesting would just be redundant here. Well, it wouldn't be fully redundant, right? Like at the end of the day, I always say when it comes to financial planners, like if you go out to find one and you're, you do the right job, this might be one of the two times in your life you do it, right? You know, these relationships, I have relationships dating back now, but I'm not that old, let's call it approaching, you know, over 20 years, right, which will probably last another 20 years on top of that. And at some point, yes, I will retire, in which case, maybe they'll be dealing with someone, they'll probably be dealing with someone else. So the point is, if you get this right, you're probably making the decision twice in your life, if you get this wrong you know, you might just stop doing this decision outright, or you might be doing it <laughs> far too frequently. So, but it reduces, it will reduce the amount of diligence needs to be done, right? The, the question of, you know, I'm starting to actually see it now, believe it or not, the American media is starting to put funnel into Canada. And prior to two years ago, I never had the question, are you a fiduciary? And now, and we used to, and now I get this big smile on my face when, when basically people ask that, because it's like, yes, you're reading the right stuff. So it will reduce the burden, but that sort of interview process should exist for various reasons. First off, and first and foremost, and here's one of the traps every so many client advisors fall into, trying to land every last client. The reality is we've only got so much bandwidth. And I wrote an article on this on ideal client book size. And the reality is just do hours of the day, if you're going to provide a really comprehensive planning service, you cannot do that for more than 100 clients, households. There's just no chance. No chance. Just do the math. And then you can find this article if you want to go look for it. But the second piece of this is that you can't be an expert of everything. And every client has unique circumstance. And really what we should be trying to do is figure out who we best service, develop services around that, and specifically target clients who do that. So when a client comes to you, a prospect comes to you, that's a complete wrong fit, square peg in a round hole, send them off to a friend who does that sort of work. Don't try to land them all, right? And, and I think part of what those questionnaires, those questions John actually has is trying to find the person who has like the life stage experience or that life situation experience because that's where the that's where we really prove our values we deliver on those situations yeah and I, so i wasn't suggesting all of john's questions will be redundant just oh, the no, ones that enough. were designed to screen for the like that fiduciary standard right that's but uh, here's the but here's a problem too you know how this is so poorly understood in this country so first off the number of times I've encountered insurance advisors who say they have a fiduciary responsibility, and I start laughing. I mean, now, now it's not their fault necessarily because the LLQP for years reported, my understanding was it actually stated that they had one when they I didn't. Literally in the LLQP exam, that was a question on the exam. 
Like, yeah. And, uh, who, yeah. Who wrote that? Like, I mean, you don't even understand what the laws, I, I, I don't get it anyway. So that's the first thing. And then hey, this came up on the rational room finder forum the other day. Uh, someone said, hey, yeah, my buddy is a MFDA advisor and he's telling me he's gotta be, a, he's a fiduciary. And my response was, okay, explain how, right? Like at best voluntary fiduciary standard through one of the organizations or designations I mentioned, but he was basically, the guy was arguing, was trying to say, no, no, I'm legally a fiduciary. And like, no, you're not, no, you're not. No, nowhere in case law or in your license is it stated that you're a fiduciary. Yeah. I just want to go back to the fiduciary thing. I've got a couple of follow-on comments here. So, so basically, as it stands today in Canada, unless you're a PM, mm -hmm. um, you're, if, if there's a case that shows up in court, one of the first things that's going to happen here is the lawyers for the client are going to try and demonstrate that that advisor was a fiduciary. Um, maybe, maybe not. And I'm not the if, best person. If there's to a reason to, to do it, I guess if there's a reason, if there's a reason. Yes. Well, they're going to, they're going to definitively try to basically create uh, or uh, to, to establish where the level of responsibility was. And if there's any shades of it being a fiduciary standard, they're going to make that argument. Yeah. Because once you get to that fiduciary standard, then, and I know this is not such a big deal in Canada, but essentially it becomes easier to award damages and the amount of damages awarded would be greater as compared to a suitability standard. Is that a fair summary? That is generally, yeah. So it goes it goes to similar laws around theft, right? There's right. actually, people don't realize, there's actually two standards for theft in this country. There's normally like me running up to you, stealing your wallet. And then there's you giving me your wallet and telling me to take care of it and me stealing from you. So what happened in the second one was you created a de facto trust. And if I am robbing under trust or power of attorney, that is a different standard, right? And I mean, that's a very simplified example, but when you're in a position of authority like that and have a fiduciary responsibility or, you know, or power of attorney, the standard of care that's that the court, that the law requires from you is substantially higher than just, you know, the average guy off the street who bumps into you. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to chat about here is uh, errors and emissions insurance. So you you are a fiduciary because of US CFP in all the, like in insurance and financial planning in yep. estate planning recommendations you really are a, because of that a fiduciary The CFP and the CFA apply on the best ones. That's fair. Um so what does that change as far as your errors and emissions insurance is that any different for you? It's changed nothing. Okay. I mean there was no there was no registration different like when when uh, when I renewed my 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 uh, Arizona emissions, I disclosed that designation and nothing happened. Okay, yeah, because yeah. that is you know I always wonder about this like physicians with medical malpractice insurance. Of course, that's uh, and I know the lawsuits are a lot larger there typically, but um, that's one that uh, I always wonder about is are we going to see if we if we had a broad acceptance of a fiduciary standard, would we start to see you know, more lawsuits and then larger E and O premiums? So let me contrast this. I'm looking into setting up an USRIA and the and guess what? The you know costs in Canada versus the US, no difference. Interesting. No difference. And of course, an RIA, a registered investment advisor in the United States, would be, especially with CFP, but there's a whole bunch of fiduciary standards that apply there. So well. Yeah. So, I mean, think about it this way. Uh, I like to say maybe there's a corresponding increase in diligence that comes with the corresponding increase in liability, right? So again, engineering for behavior. Um, so there's an economic concept where one consumes the, the marginal improvement, right? So for example, yeah. there's guardrails. Guardrails on a highway led to higher speed, more people speeding. So did, so did, uh, safety, so did seatbelts, right? So there's a marginal improvement in safety, but you consume it and now the risk equalizes. Well, you know, the same economic theory could and should hold if you're going to be held to a larger to if there's a larger chance that you're going to you're going to basically get sued and maybe go to jail <laughs> right, <laughs> for what you did. Whereas now it's like, hey, forge 80 documents and, you know, public slap on the wrist, go do something else for a year. Right. Like if that's if that's the standard of care versus versus uh, otherwise, you're going to think twice about forging those documents a little bit more. And so just going back to the idea then of delivering. Um, financial planning advice in a fiduciary standard. What do you figure you do? I mean, I know you're very diligent and, and you, you know, famously like award-winning financial plans, all that good stuff, right? What do you do in your practice that maybe others could adopt that would get them closer to that, that evidence-based standard, that client first standard? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it comes down to part of it's just a general life philosophy. Um, and that general life philosophy is one of curiosity. 
And the other one is basically, I have always hated heuristics. The end of the, you know, the more educated you become at, at certain things, the more you realize that there is a science to everything. Um, you know, I had this conversation the other day when a friend of mine asked for, you know, he said basically like, oh, uh, one of my clients, long story short, a friend of mine's bankruptcy, just the friend of his was asking, should I open up a uh, group uh, RESP, a family RESP or an individual? And I'm just like, you know, I posted a Twitter pick about yeah, like me in front of little... someone in front of a conspiracy board because yeah. it's just like me trying to explain this right it's like it sounds like a simplified question but to all things like i basically went like here's a diatribe on all the factors that come into it both you know from a practical stamp from a from a technical standpoint but also a practical application to make sure that you actually do the right thing and and basically the end of the end note was like look man he's like this is ridiculously complicated i said look there is a science to everything there is legitimately a science to everything there's, there's a science that explains i mean it's you know simple as simple as gravity there's a reason there's a, there's an entire body of mathematics to explain what's going to happen when i drop this object to the ground so i think the problem is with this industry you know a lot of bad things get taught early on like you know five times your income for insurance someone please tell me how that's a relevant metric to someone who's a multimillionaire <laughs> versus someone who was like got 20 grand you know, it's making, it's making minimum wage. Like, tell me how these things match up. How is it possible? There's a universal number, the 4% rule. I will blow my top over that every time it comes up, because please tell me where this universal number bestowed by God written on two tablets came down to us and said, thou shalt not take out more than 4%. And you know, here's the thing, like, and when you go and find out where these things came from, they're based off assumptions that are very generic. And it's not, it's not the assumption that's wrong. It's our application of it. Anyway, so the point is, is that never take anything for granted. You're confronted with decisions as to why you should do something. If you're not testing for that or looking for the body of knowledge to support the best possible outcome, you are taking a shortcut. And that shortcut is only shortcutting the client because at the end of the day, it is always them who suffers. So I 100% agree with all of that, obviously. Like, you know that in my financial planning classes, we spend a lot of time learning how to actually analyze problems. Um, the implementation there. I mean, what I find is, I agree with you, there is a science for everything. We're still early days on a lot of the science for, and, and the 4% rule, the, the Bengen rule, whatever, is a good example of this. You know, that you know where it came that, from. Most people have no idea where it came from. So 93, 94, I can't remember the exact year, but, and you know, you hear him talking about it, it's funny because he's retired now and he doesn't even live the 4% rule, right? He kind of, he said he spends... I think I heard. What does he really call it a rule? Like this. I think he, I think he yeah. mislabeled it when he did it. It's it's been it's been yeah. the bane of our existence since. It is a four percent observation, right? That's, like that's what yeah. it was. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. But there's plenty of other areas where we just don't have a, a huge amount of information available. Like the you know the idea you you rightly criticized the and that's in a CLHIA document that five times uh, income as your uh, guideline to. Uh, as to how much insurance you need, um, which drives me nuts. It's a document really designed for consumers. Sorry, there are documents designed for easy sales. That's what yeah. it is. Let me free them an easy sale. I had a you know I had a conversation with someone the other day about a retirement book, which um, I'm not going to name it because it's terrible, um, but is nothing but a collection of heuristics and nonsense I, and, and mental exactly accounting. Talking about yeah. So <laughs> so I you know trust you know just. But the, the fact that there's any semblance of credibility to this book is, is just is just an example of how people, by our nature, we satisfy. So we look for shortcuts, right? Yeah. We, that's what we do. But you know that is not respect to a that is not respect to 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 a field that should be a profession, right? There are no shortcuts in law, right? You take a shortcut in law, guess what? It's going to burn you, right? Yeah. But the other, the, I think the problem is is that too often the the mistakes and the things we do wrong early on in this industry um, basically aren't don't come you know it's hard you don't see the there's no twin doing the right thing for every client and if there was a twin doing the right thing for every client and you saw the end outcome 20 years down the road only then can you truly gauge it and even then there's still randomness to it so but but here's a simple example right one of the other ones that frustrates me when to start Canada pension plan all right and you know, there are documents, even FP Can has published one saying that, you know, the optimal one's probably 70. But the reality is, is that we got to stop looking for a universal answer. 
There is no universal answer. The answer is whatever fits best for the client situation based on all the entire fact pattern. And the only and and to test that theory, not to assume, right? So I remember when I got into the industry, 60 was the number because hey, it took you know 10 years for someone for twins born, you know, to, to anyway, point point is was a comparison 60 to 65. And then that extended to 70 to, to 11 years. And you know. What are the factors we're not talking about? And, and now the life expectancy keeps on creeping outward. Oh, now it's 70 because of the deferral benefit and the life expectancy gains. Well, okay, that's fine for someone who's experiencing that, right? But there are lots of reasons why you would start sooner than that. And I would even say that the good thing is, is that we are having, for your point, the, the research is there, but the research tends to be the generic. But here's my other point. To this. The good news is, is that we have exciting technologies coming down the pipe that are going to be able to test this in the advisor's hands and actually find what is arguably the optimal situation based on their unique fact pattern, utilizing artificial intelligence and other tools. So the good news is that the 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 the, the ease of testing for this stuff is getting a lot easier because before, I mean, simple example, I used to when I used to test for my test for um, CPP versus uh, CPP start dates. You know, you, you basically look at the entire financial plan. What's the end outcome? You move the start date to 60, look at what the impact was on the Monte Carlo analysis and on the net worth at the end. And then you do it 70 and you do the same and you try to find the point, you know, you iterate to try to find the point where it makes the most sense. Usually it polarizes across one or the other. But now, but the thing is when you throw in another decision, like when to start, you know, when to start your RIF or when to start OAS, now you're increasing the number of variables technically to the tens of thousands, right? So none of us were actually doing tens of thousands of iterations. We were kind of going down a checklist. I'm going to, I'm going to do CPP first, OAS second, RIF third. Maybe that's the right, maybe that's the right, or maybe that's not, but at least it was better, you know, given the limitations of technology and time, that was better than just applying like the defaults, which everybody else does, which is like 71 for the RIF and then you know, whatever, a lot of people still default to 60 for CPP. It's it's a frustration. Yeah, agreed. And I do agree that once we have financial planning software that has some sort of aggregation of inputs and outcomes, you know, that's that's a brilliant step in the right direction. And I would love to see it where that information feeds back into, and I know this is sensitive with client confidentiality, but I mean, when you talk about evidence-based financial planning, I'd love to see where, you know, a thousand financial planners delivered this recommendation, clients did this, here were the outcomes. And you really- I can tell you that's to, coming. Yeah, I can that, tell you that's, certainly that's coming. That's exciting. I, and I think I know what financial planning software, at least one example that you're talking about. Well, one that. example in Canada, but that's also start, starting to happen in the US where they're talking about building those systems. So this is, you know, the entire, okay, we've all done the best thing in isolation, but now let's look at it on the aggregate and that, that'll actually pan out. And where, you know, where should we be tweaking these things? And, and I think it's also important to recognize, and there's a trap here, okay? It's important to recognize that a financial plan is a snapshot in time, and I can pretty much guarantee you it will be wrong in the future. Yes. But and, and there are people who are unfortunately use that as a excuse to detract from doing them or saying that they're not valid. But in reality, at the end of the day, what if that's they're framing the, 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 the use of it wrong. A financial plan is a snapshot in time that just that text that tests the direction and and possible outcome of what you're currently doing. And if what you're currently doing is not sustainable, it needs to be edited. And the and it needs to be and that plan needs to be constantly updated. I mean, like it's like going to your doctor for a physical. Your physical from five years ago has nothing to do with your physical for today, right? Now the co the combination of those points creates a trend, right? Yeah. As long as that trend is heading in the right direction and the probability of outcome basically continues to get better and better, then that's what we're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, this is, in fact, just last Thursday, I had my first day of a new uh, CFP core curriculum class. We talked about this exact thing. The financial plan is wrong, basically the second it comes off the printer or yeah. however you distribute it to your client, but that's not the point. The point is to help with decision making, to create optionality, to avoid big mistakes, right? Those are, that's what we're yeah. doing financial plans for. Yeah, it's optimizing for that moment in time, but it's also, I think that criticism is is misguided in so many ways because end of the day, it's like you're looking for deterministic outcomes in a probabilistic world, right? And the, and the sooner you get your head around the fact that, you know, there are no, there are no certainties in life and there are no uh, fixed points that everything's a variable, you know, change is the natural state of the universe. And, and you have to understand that, you know, end of the day, we can make our plans, but we have to iterate on those plans and, and thinking that you can take a snapshot and make it happen is insane. So I'm hoping that you can give a little plug for, uh, you already mentioned it briefly, but a little plug for the Financial Planning Association of Canada. 
Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so yes, so Financial Planning Association of Canada, we are a nascent organization whose two, second anniversary will happen later this year before the end of the year. And we are currently sitting at just under 180 members, uh, been slowly growing, we launched with a little over 100. And our, our membership growth initiatives have been largely curtailed by COVID because we were planning on doing a lot of grassroots. But let me, let me tell you what we stand for, what it is we're doing, and what we've accomplished in a very short period of time. So the Financial Planning Association of Canada is 100% dedicated to the professionalization of financial planning. We are the only organization who has outlined what we believe that to be. So take a look at our charter. You either believe in what we're trying to accomplish or you don't. If you believe in what we're trying to accomplish, then know that we are, you know, go ahead and look at it elsewhere. You will not find it. We are the ones who are basically trying to make that a reality. Everybody else has got their own agendas. That's fine. I'm not going to debate them or the merits of whatever they are. But that's that's the starting point. The second piece is what are we doing to get there? And we look at it as a three-pronged uh, approach. Yet again, I like three-pronged approaches. What can I say? The first one is the betterment of our membership to get them to a professional standard. We do not expect people to be the perfect, fully baked advisor that's going to hopefully be the case in 20 years' time, whatever it is. We we know that everybody's coming from a starting point, and we are doing what we can to give them the resources to do that. What does that include? That includes um, basically a robust member forum, which is fantastic and worth the price. You've said it yourself, worth the price of admission alone. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, like you post a question and you have multiple answers cited with resources and best practices, you name it. And uh, evidence, within, evidence. And evidence <laughs> and evidence. And yeah. and you know, basically, you know, you're collaborating with 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 your peers at all various various sorts of levels and experiences. It is a fantastic resource. Then uh, we also have started to build out our practice management portal. Our practice management portal is a bunch of is basically a resource for best practices. By the time it's done, and it will take years to get there, mind you, because we keep on rolling out a couple pages per month, it will be hopefully a turnkey approach to how to create and run your practice and give you all the best guidance we possibly can. So we're we're slowly building upon that. The uh, the the, edu uh, the educational portal uh, will at some point will, is slowly being built out right now. It's all our previous um, CE credit um, available, all the previous uh, webinars we've hosted, and that one will eventually start to incorporate the actual evidence we reference. So where the you know what is it when you do. <laughs> You know, where is this research on CP on starting CPP? Where is this research on on um, on on advisor value? Whatever it is, like, where is the supporting evidence that will basically help you uh, make these decisions and educate yourself better about the evidence out there? Uh, we currently uh, provide for ten um, ten different um, uh, webinars throughout the year that all qualify for, uh, for for continuing education credits. One of which will always be compliance. It's always the hardest one to get. Um, and, and those are just kind of the initial ones. We have larger, larger, uh, we have a lot on the go. We have a partnership with Money Sense as well uh, that will help our members give an opportunity to write and get themselves in the media with, again, evidence-based advice. It's actually called qualified advice. And I can't say it right now, but there are two or three really large announcements that are going to be coming out in the next little while. Um, and one of the ones that we're working towards publicly that we that people know of is, is a, a pro bono initiative, which you've been generous enough to help with, that is looking to partner with associations in Canada to provide advisors to basically provide advice to those who would not, who are in need, who typically would not have access to it. So there is a tremendous amount on the go. Some of it's launched, some of it's pending. I will tell you that in six months time, there will be a lot more done, but we've, for two years, we've done a lot. The second piece, second stool, is the ecosystem development. So that is basically knowing that we have to work with regulators, vendors, governments, you name it, to basically create the world we need because we need everything from technology to regulation and to law to change. So I've been, we've been heavily involved and had a great relationship with regulators over title reform uh, in various provinces, mostly Ontario, but now we're starting with the other provinces as they, as they roll out, um, in addition to CFR uh, feedback and um, and have actually been going around speaking to various ministries of finance about different initiatives we wish to pursue and, and getting some early interest. So we've been very active on that front. And then the, and there's a kind of ecosystem initiative coming that we're going to announce shortly. And then the last piece is the public awareness piece, right? So the public awareness of what financial planning really is. It is not walking into a bank and getting sold a mutual fund with next, with a five minute conversation. Like that is, I'm just picking on what I call the lowest hanging fruit there. But what financial planning is, you look at surveys and you've seen these, these are laughable, where Canadians are asked, do you have a financial plan? And something like two thirds say yes, and one third of them say it's in their head, and the other ones say they have it written down. And it's like, I'm sorry, it, that's not the, that's, there's no chance, there's no chance. I think my entire career, I've seen two other financial plans done with clients who came in, and one of which was a spreadsheet done by a buddy of his who had no 
you know, no contemplation for taxation or any laws. So it was, it was a joke, right? So the reality is, is Canadians don't even understand what it is that professional financial planners do. We need to change that. The Money Sense Partnership is one of those, uh, one of the conduits for that, but we plan on building that more, out more over time. It's, for me, it's been great. I have, uh, I mean, first off, I've just met a ton of great people through mm. FPAC. That's been uh, top notch. And like the forums, yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough of the forums where you get really a great diversity of, uh, of opinions or mm -hmm. diversity of experience on there. And yeah, there's no question you can ask on there where you don't get um, some yeah. useful answer and useful conversation. And it's very normal that, you know, those conversations flow out into, you know, follow on comments and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's that. funny because when I, I've, I've, uh, I remember previously, you know, when I brought this up to other organizations, I was in regarding forms like, well, you know, the resort, well, how do we ensure the answers are right? I'm like, how does Wikipedia ensure the answers are right? <laughs> you know, the community is going to take care of it. And that's exactly what's happened is, is, you know, every now and then something wrong will be posted. And I'm guilty of that too. Sometimes maybe I misread the question or the context is wrong, or I forget one of the 1 million tax rules I know, but you know, someone will say, you know, someone else will question it or provide the answer, in which case we're like, Oh, let's correct for this. Right. So there's a lot of, you know, there's it's, it's been solid thus far. And um, you know, a lot of, you're only going to be, let's put it this way, just, just signing up for the association and just getting the weekly digests on what comes out of that thing is going to make you a better planner. I 100% agree. Yeah, that's that is a strong foundation for evidence-based uh, financial planning. Now, can I just hit one more question because you touched on it in there, and that's education. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we'll wrap up. But um, can you talk a little bit about uh, degree requirement or education requirements for financial planners? Yeah. So uh, more recently, um, the CF, oh, sorry, uh, FP Canada required that you have a post-secondary education in order to challenge a CFP. Um, that is, I consider, a important step. Now, I've had this debate with other people in the past, and they think it's a limiting factor. Here's the reality of it. You expect your doctor to go to medical school. You expect your lawyer to go to law school. Um, at the end of the day, this is, and this goes back to evidence, where else are you going to get a foundational understanding of the evidence in this industry? Because right now the industry as, or this profession, because the industry has failed miserably. Because you think about where most education comes from. It comes from product providers who've got an agenda to sell their own product, if it's in, even if it's in conflict with the evidence. And that's the problem, right? So, you know, I think one of the strongest things that I ever did was get a very, very strong foundational understanding from academia as to as to, as to the foundations of, of, of evidence in, in, uh, in investing. And I, you know, I'm not to say that I was perfect. I went down some of the wrong roads because I still fell in some of the traps, but nevertheless, you know, that skill set is important. And if you look at what's happened elsewhere in the world, specifically in the U S now, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think last, the last CFP sitting, it was the first time ever more people who were, who were coming straight out of university at a post-secondary at a post-secondary institutions were challenging the CFP versus second career people. It was actually over 50% for the first time. Really? And that I is, yeah, that, yeah. And that is that, that, that I, I, I wish I kept the article, but that one just, you know, that was a, Oh, thank God you're getting there. Right. And it's, oh. it's basically to me, it was, and let me explain why the reason that is, is because many U S universities in the U S have developed full comprehensive financial planning programs down there. And when I say programs, you can get a PhD in financial planning now at some schools, right? And they have they have been building these things out. So if you you discover financial planning and you're lucky enough to go to one of these schools, you will come out one of the you will come out with a level of training ready to tackle this that no one in this country comes out of any school with. Yeah. I and yeah, there's I think it's about 162 schools that have a um, bachelor's program in financial planning now in the US. I yeah. think that's the right number. I, I always get to the first chunk of the, they call it the registered, uh, registered providers conference, I think. Cool. It overlaps with another conference I go to down there. And then I, I don't know, something like 30 have a graduate program and four with PhD programs. Yeah. It's so the, like Texas Tech yeah. and Creighton, I think Georgia, I'm not sure who else got the four. Uh, four KSU. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's right. KSU would be. So, yeah. So, I mean, the reality is, is that they're you know, you think about how young our profession is, like the CFP dates back to the seventies. Um, and, yeah. you know, really <laughs> good financial planning software dates back to the early eighties at best, right? The, the reality is we are an incredibly young profession, doctors and lawyers and accounts date back millennia, 
millennia. Like we, you know, we we can read stories about Roman and Greek, you know, <laughs> lawyers and and Roman and Greek doctors, and uh, you know, basically double double entry bookkeeping dates back to like the, the 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 dark ages and the Vatican basically keeping track of money coming in and out. Yeah. The the reality is is that and even before that you had money exchangers, but the but the reality is we are a incredibly young profession, and to think that in the U.S. Think about that. Like what other what other profession has ever gone to the, the 100 plus programs in such a short period of time? Yeah. And, okay. you know, and yet in Canada, we have courses, we don't have programs. And that's yeah. a problem. Yeah, absolutely. OK, well, thanks very much, Jason. That was uh, broad reaching. I'm glad we got to dig into fiduciary standard a lot. That's something that I think people don't have a great understanding of. So. I think people will find those comments valuable. And I really want to give that plug for FPAC. I think it's just, it's been wonderful for me. I've, I've had my opinions changed on things. I've uh, you know had lots of uh, opportunity for good discussion there and met lots of great people. So thank you. Thanks for the great work no, you're doing. Been working out fantastic. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. And good luck with today's webinar. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, Jason's not the first guest to call me out on something. I like it. I, I'm glad that, uh, I am glad, and this is what I find is one of the benefits here. Um, you know, I joined FPAC and I wasn't really sure about the fiduciary concept and I'm largely owing not so much to actually stuff I saw at FPAC, but uh, exactly what Jason talked about here, uh, listening to Michael Kitsis over and over and over again. Uh, this is where I did come to the conclusion that I think the industry would be well served by a fiduciary standard. I think people who take the business of planning seriously, um, would do well with a fiduciary standard. I don't know that um, that we need it. I don't know how it looks on the insurance side. I guess this is my concern. And I'm going to have somebody on an upcoming episode where I'm going to ask this question about exactly what happens on the insurance side. I know um, Jason and I have spoken about this, about what he does. And he does a uh, something much beyond, let's say, the reasons why letter. He has a, a good uh, sort of pro forma starting point for an insurance disclosure and goes from there and makes recommendations that are well supported by evidence. And I think that's key here. And I do want to just go down the path of talking about something. I see this done um, poorly, very, very regularly, and it concerns me. Um, and this is a life insurance needs analysis. Now, I'm going to steal something from Jim Ruta here. Um, and Jim does a good job. He talks about uh, needs analysis versus a wants analysis. Now, Jim also um, says that uh, financial planning is killing the insurance business. And that's a discussion we could have separately. But needs analysis is the amount that would actually be needed then. And then I do think this is valid. Beyond that, we should have a discussion with our client about wants, about what else do we want to make sure would be well taken care of in the event of your premature death or in the event that you became uh, disabled unexpectedly? What else do you want to make sure is taken care of? And that's the wants analysis side of it. So get uh, needs analysis and then a wants analysis. So the needs analysis is, in my mind, where we should be starting. And if we're talking about an income replacement needs analysis, so we've got somebody who's young and as a mortgage and a family and so forth, then in my mind, we should be figuring out what the sort of base amount of insurance, I don't want to say the minimum amount of insurance because that sounds uh, not quite right, but we do want to make sure that we're not selling something that somebody doesn't need. Those dollars that go to insurance premiums can be used for other things like retirement savings or disability insurance or critical illness insurance or just spend them on a vacation. They're still precious dollars. So we don't want to over-insure somebody. And uh, notably, um, needs analysis software does a pretty poor job of this. It's quite uh, dated now, but Sean Brayman did a paper back in March 2009. I've spoken about before on this podcast where he shows that the vast majority of uh, needs analysis software um, needs estimates are about 40% too high for what the math actually supports. So Basically, the way you do a needs analysis here is not to take debt plus five times income or debt times 10 times income or something like that, but rather to look at the situation today. We say, what are the current set of household expenses? 
And then we have a conversation with the client. We say, okay, what would this look like? What would change in the event of a premature death? So would you have increased childcare expenses, for example? Would the mortgage be paid off? Have we got that lump sum available to pay off the mortgage? And we want to work through and have a good, now you're not going to get sort of line by line fidelity necessarily, but there are some big adjustments that you'll typically see. And then we arrive at an annual cash flow shortfall. And we should recognize that that cash flow shortfall uh, may or may not uh, be the same year after year after year. You might have to sort of jump ahead a theoretical five or 10 or 15 years and look at what happens out there. So if you have, for example, kids in the household who are athletes, then as teenagers, those athletic endeavors get quite expensive. And maybe you want to build a little cushion in for those expenses. So we want to figure out what that shortfall is. That is how much are we missing? Now, one area that I find is overlooked here sometimes is around retirement planning. Um, and especially where you have somebody who has a uh, pension or some workplace contributions, then those are often part of the household sort of assumed level of eventual retirement savings. And we want to make sure that if the plan or if the uh, household member who dies prematurely was also a beneficiary of a pension plan. Now the survivor is going to get that starting point. They're going to get the value of that pension as of the date of death. But from there, we want to make sure that we have appropriate retirement savings after that. And I find that is an area that gets overlooked a little bit when you have a household with a pension. You might also consider the impact of a loss of OAS and loss of CPP. And we shouldn't assume that the household expenses are going to be cut in half when you go from two people in retirement to one person in retirement. Uh, stats bear out that this should actually be somewhere in the range of 70%. So a, a one-person household would typically have about 70% of the income of a two-person household. Now, Jason mentions in here that he dislikes rule of thumb, and I agree with that. And certainly if you're sort of five or 10 years out from retirement, you can probably do better than a rule of thumb there. But when you're 30 or 35 and that retirement is 30 or 35 years down the road and you're looking at sort of that retirement planning, then to some extent we have to adopt heuristics. Now that 70% heuristic does come from evidence. That's something that uh, demographers use. That's the kind of thing you would find stats can doing or very close to it anyways in terms of that estimate of two-person household to one-person household and how does our spending change. So once you get that annual shortfall, then you wanna do a time value of money calculation and you would say, okay, we need 30 years or whatever the period is of income replacement. You don't need a lifetime of income replacement here because you're going, unless that person was gonna work until they died, you're going to have already built a retirement plan or be working on a retirement plan those assets should be part of that retirement planning conversation. And we should be able to sort of replace income slash replace that shortfall, that household shortfall uh, over that time frame. So that's where just a, a straight up time value of money calculation and you want to use an assumed rate of return here. You probably want a fairly conservative portfolio. This is kind of like a retirement portfolio. It's not really a, a long-term portfolio. So you want to build a portfolio much the same as you would do for retirement. So maybe you're using something like a two or 3% real rate of return net of fees. And keep in mind, this is probably non-registered money. So there's tax to pay on that investment income. Now it's not going to be taxed typically at your full marginal tax rate. We can build some tax efficiency there, but really that's what you want to do. You want to run that calculation where we are taking into account your annual shortfall or different shortfalls possibly that might require a series of calculations and then coming back and solving for present value and then add debts and any other immediate needs. Maybe there's a, a want there to throw in some cash so that the surviving spouse can take some time off or go back to school or take the kids on a big trip somewhere. I've seen all of these things done. And certainly when we, I think, talk to people about what they would like their surviving spouse to deal with, this would be a good example.
Okay, it's time for show and tell again here so that we can do our quiz. So I'm holding a key. This key normally sits on the shelf. It lays flat on the shelf right about here. And this key was given to me my, by my wife. We don't buy each other a lot of gifts, but she found it in an antique store and I, it was uh, just something she thought I would enjoy having. And I like it. It's a neat little trinket, um, old style brass key. So that's our quiz question for today. The answer would be key. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to just uh, go over real quick here, and again, this is something we're going to talk about in more detail in upcoming episodes, but there's been a lot of press lately because the client-focused reform, sort of the full package is available here. Uh, Marshall and I talked about this on the episode, uh, that'd be episode two of season four. And there's sort of two uh, thresholds here with client-focused reforms. So first off, we have the June 30th um, release, or the June 30th requirements. So this is from a web page, uh, Steichman.com, a law firm that did a good summary of CFR, just a very short summary. I'll include it in the show notes. Uh, so the June 30th requirements are that as of that date, uh, conflicts of interest must be disclosed. Okay, We have talked about conflicts of interest here before. Uh, but conflicts of interest, mostly what they're focused on here is from proprietary products and incentives. So compensation-based conflicts of interest. I do think there are other sources of conflicts of interest. And we talked about this back a little bit in uh, episode, or season one, about episode seven, if I remember correctly, um, where we talked about possible conflicts of interest with couples. And then the other is referral arrangements and referral arrangements have to be monitored, documented, supervised, and of course, disclosed. And then the big changes here, I would suggest anyways, for many folks are going to be end of the year. So by December 31st of 2021, we have a full on know your product responsibility. That means you have to understand and have a reason for selling the products you're selling uh, this would tie into, for example, that needs analysis discussion that we just went through. We have a more robust know your client responsibility. And this is the one where I find the argument shows up that how can you really do any sort of investment planning without having done a financial plan that is having a proper picture of what this person should have in their various accounts on which to retire and when they're going to draw assets down and so forth. Uh, suitability determination. So Jason talked about suitability here in this episode a little bit. And um, suitability is sort of a step down from fiduciary. Suitability says basically whatever I'm selling my client won't harm them. I have to show how whatever I'm selling here is suitable for the client. It's not quite to the same level as fiduciary but it is going to be an enhanced suitability requirement. And then relationship disclosure information. So this is where you have to show the product you're offering. And this would mostly be a concern for, let's say, proprietary products or products that might pay a different kind of compensation than what we're used to. So if you're on the mutual fund dealers, dealers association side and you're selling mutual funds that have the same compensation across the board, this is probably less a concern, um, not to say you should eliminate it. And certainly your compliance department will have comment on this. Uh, misleading communications. I think this is one that we haven't really explored fully yet. I'm interested to see where this turns out because there's now going to be, there's some uh, title restrictions here. This is going to overlap a little bit with the financial advisor and financial planner title protection that we're seeing in Ontario, Saskatchewan, and uh, now New Brunswick as well. So we have to make sure that how we present ourselves as a financial advisor uh, matches with who we really are. And then finally, uh, compliance training. So this is gonna require firms to provide compliance training on how to meet these obligations. And I'd be surprised if you haven't already been to some webinars or the like uh, dealing with client-focused reforms. Um, I want to just take a second to thank uh, Christian. Christian was good enough to leave us a review on uh, 
Apple Podcasts. Much appreciated, Christian. I know Christian's been a listener for quite a while, and uh, he specifically credits the podcast with helping him learn. And I know Christian is a dedicated learner. He's actually also an FPAC member and quite active in the forums there. But he also comments that he used it when he was writing his CFP exam to help prepare for that exam. Okay, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us for today's episode. Our next episode, as I mentioned, will be another sort of related to our fiduciary obligations and some compliance questions in there. And I look forward to uh, that one as well. I'm recording that interview later on today. So thanks very much and enjoy your continued studies.